Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Tata Steel Chess 2024. This is the first major event of the year, and this is round number eight out of 13. Every single round continues to deliver. We are getting insane results left and right. We are getting upsets. We are getting storylines. We are getting close races for first place finishes. And that is even in the absence of the top three chess players currently ranked uh, in the world. And in today's video, one of the biggest developments is regarding the current world champion of chess. That is, of course, Ding Liren. And uh, this whole recap is going to have crazy games. The last game has some of the most gangster moves I've ever seen. Let's just jump right into it. Um, yeah, here we go. Ali Reza Faruja versus Ding Liren. I mean, in this event, you can play seven games against killers, and your eighth round is against the world champion. Or, look at it in reverse, your eighth round is against the young prodigy who is formerly rated 2800. Ali Reza plays d4. Uh, Ali Reza's also had a little bit of an up and down event. He's lost to Ju Wen Jun. Yesterday, he lost a game as well. That was to Vidit Gujarati. Ding Li Ran is currently on an equal score. And from the opening, Ding Li Ran opts to kill the game. Uh, this semi Taraj variation is very forcing and basically opts to neutralize white completely. Ali Reza says e3, thinks a little while, keeps the position symmetrical, and this is our position after five moves. They're basically copying each other. Ali Reza plays a3. The idea of a3 is to take on c5 and then push your b-pawn, threaten the bishop, the bishop can go to like a7, and then white goes here and we create just a slight imbalance of the position. Instead of that, Ding Li Ren goes here, and then he does the exact same thing to Ali Reza. Now here Ali Reza plays this move, uh, not, not there, he plays queen c2. Now, there have been many things played here, normally they involve castling and pushing these pawns forward. Uh, d5 is a little bit too early because after pawn takes, knight takes d5, there's bishop 2e6, and black develops very quickly, white doesn't have any tactics. Ali Reza plays queen c2, which looks brain dead. Queen c2 removes a defender of the pawn, and in fact just seems like it's gonna lose the pawn completely. Like, that move doesn't make any sense. Now, Ding takes, but you'll notice he spends 17 minutes, which means that queen c2 comes as a sort of home-baked preparation, or maybe home-sautéed, or flambéed, or toasted, or broiled, or takeout, I don't know, but I, I, I don't know if it's home-baked. Queen c2, though, is a crazy idea. Ding takes, and for whatever reason, he does not take again, he plays bishop to b7, okay? Obviously, there was a point. I think the point is that after knight takes d4, queen takes d4, white actually has knight d5, which is insane, clearing queen c6 out, which would win a rook. And yet, you could actually do that. You could actually do all of this. You can play knight takes d5, queen c6, king e7, queen a8, knight e3, queen a7 check, king e8, queen e3, queen e3, f e3, bishop d6, and apparently black is equal? But I don't know why anybody would voluntarily have a rook for a bishop. Like, I, I, I don't know, like, nobody is stockfish. So that's apparently the idea. Bishop b7 played instead. Now Ali Reza's like, ha ha, old man, you didn't want my d-pawn? Well, now you're gonna have to take it. You're gonna have to take it, even though you protect it three times. This is nuts. Ali Reza introduces a fascinating idea where he's like, all right, ding, here you go. But it's like choking on a fish bone, right? Now I'm gonna go bishop g5. I'm pinning you. I got rook d1 on the way or long castle and rook is coming here as well. So white gets very quick development here. Ding is on the back foot. All right, bishop to e7. Rook d1 by Ali Reza. Every piece is getting a turn to play. Ding plays d4, and this is too forcing. Instead of d4, Ding should just castle and accept the fact that he will lose this pawn and it will come with some headaches, but he shouldn't try to keep it on the board because after d4, Ali Reza just castles, and the opening of this bishop could prove to be fatal. d4, castles, castles. You can't take the knight because of the pin on the queen. Rookie one, every piece Ali Reza has is in the game. Both rooks, both bishops, both knights, and the queen as well. The queen has also got eyes over there, and it's really got eyes over there because after Ding Li Ren plays b4, Ding spends 24 minutes on b4 trying to really force this issue. Look at this subtle idea. Bishop b1. Bruce Lee style. And now we have nasty intentions. We're gonna take the knight. We've got a sniper of a queen. Neither pawn can take the knight. Look at this position. This is nuts. The knight can't be taken because you're going to play bishop f6, queen h7. So now Ding has to go g6. And now Ali Reza shows all 
of his ideas. In a position, it's very rare in chess to have every piece playing. He's got all seven pieces on the board and they're all doing something. And now Ali Reza sacrifices the rook. Rook takes e7. And the entire integrity of the black position is called into question. You cannot take with the queen. Even though you would be defending your knight because I'll, I'll go here and that's it. It's a knockout. You have to sacrifice your queen and then knight e7 and then I'll play like queen c5 and... Yeah, I mean, bishop, knight, bishop, knight, rook, rook. But at the end of the day, Ali Reza's position is too powerful. So instead of that, what Ding does is he takes with the knight. And the idea is that the knight here is still hanging. Well, now Ali Reza plays rook d4 and simply moves the knight to the e4 square. Now, in this position, Ding actually blunders. With his queen hanging, he should have abandoned all of this right away and played queen e8, apparently. Or he can play knight f d5 which is a demon move, opening up two separate pins to your position, but then the computer plays queen b6 and claims black can survive. But in all of these complications, Ding kind of plays queen c7, absent, you know, a little bit absent-mindedly, just like, all right, I'm pinning the knight here and Ali Reza will probably take back, and Ali Reza just plays knight e4, and the point of knight e4 is the queen see each other, and knight takes f6 as a check. So, Ding takes, but when the dust settles, Ali Reza has bishop and knight for a rook. So for whatever reason, you know, D Ding plays queen c7, but he could have went here and lost nothing. Knight takes d5, bishop takes d5, bishop e7, queen e7, rook d5 is also two pieces for a rook. But then black has very strong counterplay on, on white's back rank. And uh, you've also got counterplay here. But... Ding plays queen c7, and when it's all said and done, he's, he, it's just two pieces for the rook, and white is completely winning. Rook c8, knight g4 back, the bishop is hanging, right? You can play rook c2, but then bishop f6 and knight h6 is mate. So Ding has to go here, Ali Reza centralizes, he just has to not get back rank mated, he's defending himself, now he can't get back rank mated, and Ali Reza simply has two pieces. He has two bishops for a rook, two bishops for a rook is a winning advantage, and now he's simply up a piece! So the dust clears, this rook is completely stuck, Ding tries to go here, rook f2 is a desperado sacrifice, bishop h6 is also a desperado sacrifice with a check, because you were going to win the rook anyway, and uh, do the math, white just has an extra piece, he advances, he's going to get to the pawn, that's it, this is just a winning endgame, one guy has a bishop, the other guy doesn't, it's pretty simple mathematics, and Ding Li Ren resigns. Because he's going to lose both pawns, and then this pawn is going to promote. This is insane. Ali Reza absolutely demolishes the world champ in a crazy tactical position with a savage opening idea. Queen c2, and then d5, and he just gets all his pieces into the game. This is vintage Ali Reza. I mean, vintage. He's 20 years old. Everything he does is vintage. Like, look at this. Bishop b1. What an incredible attacking concept. And Ding just defended inaccurately and loses the second game. Ding has as many points, he has three and a half points. He has as many points as the women's world champion, Ju Wen Jun. But he's 2780, and she's 2550, and they got the same score. She's really overperforming, and he, he, he's having a rough event. I got some more games for you, though. Jan Nipomnishi versus Nodjerbek Abdul Satorov. This game was crazy. This was actually a masterclass of a game. Then I will show you Hans Niemann. Then I will show you Marc-Andrea Maritzi versus Salem Saleh in the challenger section. We have the matchup of the two young women as well, Deshmuk versus Rubers, and then this game was bananas. Jan Nipomnishi, Nodjerbek, Abdus Sotorov, this is an Italian. A Russian and an Uzbek man travel to the Netherlands to play an Italian game. Chess is just so beautifully global, isn't it? Bishop e7, none of this matters. Nepo plays like this, he plays a very odd Italian game. They trade. And then, basically, Jan just has light squared control, right? Black has a lot of pawns on the dark squares. Pretty anti-positional type of game, but we're far away from any big decisions. Now, look at this fascinating idea, bishop to d2. The idea is actually very simple. After knight a5, Jan wants to give away his bishop. Then he wants to come back with the rook to a2, because maybe you will double, right? Not, not a1. Both guys still in their prep. Queen c7. And now knight c3, both guys still in their prep. a5, seizing a little bit more control. Queen e2 is the first move kind of out of book. Knight d7, and now we are, we are truly thinking on our own. We have b3. 
And Jan creates this nice structure, not allowing that pawn forward. He's got good ideas over there. Black cannot play d5. The major question is, will black play f5? If black doesn't play f5, black has zero pawn breaks. And again, the bishop is the problem for black because black has so many pawns on dark squares. Knight c5. Jan, very simple. Knight a4. Let's trade knights. He says no. Now, this is a genius move by Jan Yipomshi. In this position, Jan Yipomshi plays c5. It's a brilliant idea. It deserves a brilliant move. The computer doesn't even fully understand. That, that's just a lost pawn. Just DC. But by breaking black's pawns apart like this, black now has zero mobility. And you will never be able to use a D or a B pawn, because you don't have them. So this is going to go here. I will apply pressure for the rest of the game. Your structure is dead. Black is almost already completely positionally lost. Knight to D4. Queen d3, watch this masterclass. Rook, rook a1, black has no moves. And slowly as the game is going to progress, black's evaluation is going to go more and more in white's favor. The, not, eva not the black's evaluation, the evaluation in general. g3. All right. Ideas there, covering this. Queen b4. Knight c4, he's not even taking. He's not even, he's slowly, slowly. But no, queen e3, look at this. Queen c3, queen trade? Yes, but now I'm going to take. And now the structure is just atrocious. I mean, now white is already uh, equal in pawns and has more pressure. Queen c3 takes takes. Rook a5, knight e4, knight b6. And these pawns are just sitting around waiting to be taken. Rook a8, trading a rook, applying more pressure. Rook takes. Rook a8 hitting another piece. And Nodjerbeck goes for this endgame, but th there's just nothing, nothing he can do. Nepo is going to very slowly, very methodically, look at the king, just journeying up the board to take part. King e7, rook d6, there are no moves for black. Rook c8, it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. Rook d6, knight d6 coming in now, threatening this, threatening this, threatening knight f5, g4, g5, yet another idea. He just goes here, and now he's just going to win the rook endgame. And uh, there is really not much more to analyze here. Because this was just an absolute masterclass from start to finish. You know, Nepo paralyzed the black position, swarmed in. The, white, the knight is just trapped now. Have you noticed? The knight is trapped. Rook b3. Knight f1. He's just dancing around. h4. Patiently waiting. Biding his time. And now he zips away to try to win the c-pawn. He will win the c-pawn. This is like mate pretty soon. g4. Knight d6 check. Knight c8 check. And uh, he doesn't even take. He doesn't even take. Taking is fine. F4 is also very strong. Two pass pawns. Just can't stop. Nojebek resigns. He could have played knight b1. White would have went like king d3. He, would, he could have went knight a3. Knight would have danced around. You can even force a knight trade. Just knight b5. The knight is stuck. It's completely stuck. It goes here. King c2. And the game is over. Why, uh, black cannot stop the pawns. What a masterclass. I mean, this is such an incredible idea by Nepo. It's incredible how... On move 18, he played a pawn move that broke Black's structure and permanently immobilized literally his entire position. Like, expertly done. What an idea. None of these pawns could move anymore, despite being a pawn up. Black swallowed a pawn but paralyzed four of his, or four, four of his organs. It's just unbelievable, right? Like, you eat one thing, four organs stop working. Don't, don't eat the thing. Sounds pretty bad. Masterclass performance by Nepo. Uh, big win over Nozibek, who, by the way, was tied for first. Now... This is a little bit of a bathroom break of a game. Hans Demon. You know, I gotta, I gotta cover Hans. Folks are interested in Hans. Some of you, like, hate Hans. Some of you love Hans. But here's the thing about Hans. You're always gonna watch. You're always gonna watch because you're fascinated, right? So he's playing Ervin Lamy. By the way, they, they put out something recently about uh, Ervin. Uh, Ervin uh, is, is actively playing this tournament while recovering from a form of cancer. He had um, Hodgkins, uh, I believe is what it was called. And uh, they put out something on, on social media. And, and last year, Irvin um, won the Dutch championship while having this illness, which you talk about resiliency. And, and, and they, there was a clip out of him that, that was saying, um, you know, now he has a different perspective on life and he doesn't take chess results and positions as harshly because he knows how delicate life can be. And I was like, man, that is... Uh, that is a that was a powerful piece of content, and um, wish him nothing but the best. I mean that 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 is really admirable stuff. Um, all right, here we go. C six, Queen's Gambit declined. This is like a vintage opening. White plays knight e two. White's gonna try to play h three or f three e four, 
And I told you this game is a little bit of a bathroom break because Hans put typical Queen's Gambit declined pressure, uh, but Irvin uh, neutralized. And Hans built up a pretty pleasant edge and broke through with e4. All right, Irvin traded down, played knight f6. I think Hans had a chance here uh, not to take right away, but first play knight e7, which attacks this. And then after rook c7, there's a little bit of a difference in that knight c6 is hand. And I don't know why Hans didn't play knight e7. He probably didn't like knight d6. Where after knight c8, rook c8. I mean, I don't know. White is still up in exchange. <laughs> so I, I... That was the uh, top computer line. But I'm like, wh why would anybody play like that? Maybe they maybe thought about f6? But then queen e4 is a check. So I, I, I don't know. But instead of knight e7, he goes here, and this move is just right on time, and um, yeah, uh, black is uh, able to stabilize, and, and, and the two of them uh, made a draw. So, it took a little while, but it took like 15 more moves. We got to a draw in a rook endgame. A little bathroom break. Uh, Hans draws against uh, Ervin. Now, here are some banger games. Salem Saleh, one of the most dynamic, exciting players in the world. Versus Marc-Andrea Marizzi, Marizzi from France, who is just cooking this tournament. He plays a semi-slav, and Marc-Andrea does not take the pawn. He does not accept the pawn, so a few moves later, Salem takes the pawn. Bishop f4, and he gives away the bishop. This is a really interesting idea. He gives away the bishop for the knight, and he goes here to pressure the diagonal. Rook e1. Now white is bothering black with the queen. Black is defending, and now black starts fighting back on the queen side. Queen b5, but visually, white is always going to have a little bit of an edge. Queen a4, and then here Mark Andre says, yo, bro, what if I just grab a pawn? Just take the pawn, what are you going to do? Well, the Arabic Falcon doesn't need two invitations to take flight, right? He's got the bishops, he's got this, he's got this, he's got, he's got all this pressure, he's got a really nice position. Knight takes, he forces the knight back, he gets in with the rook. Really dangerous position. Rook d8, very passive defense, but maybe there's no way through. I mean, white's got really annoying pressure. But Marc Andre is defending himself. Bishop c4. And here's the thing about defending yourself for a really long time. Like at some point, you know, the other guy might get a little bit too confident. And then let's not forget, you're still a pawn up. And uh oh, wait, we're threatening a queen trade. What's going on? Well, apparently, yeah, that's exactly what I'm describing. Like, white had no further way through. And suddenly, white is going to start uh, realizing that it, it, it was not so easy as he thought because black's just a pawn up. The pressure suddenly subsides. Salem is still trying to create some complications, but at this point, he's trying to, like, survive an endgame. A, B, Bishop, B4. And suddenly, Marc Andre is like, wait a minute, I'm playing for a win. Dude, I'm not playing to draw. I'm not playing to hold. I'm playing for a win. They repeat moves. And here comes Marc Andre. Look at this. The young man from France is on fire. He is cooking. He's up two pawns. White's king is on the verge of getting mated. Salem takes on B6. The knight comes back, queen c2, he just needs to find a way in. Can he find a way in? Bishop h5, bishop g6, white's running away with the pawn. Knight e5. A nice idea with queen d2. If you take, if you keep trying to run the pawn away with a6, I'll play here, I'll attack your queen. If you keep trying to run away, I'll play queen d2. You're so close! But so far, it's mate. Queen g1, knight b6 is the key idea. That is the key idea. Also, knight e3 probably just wins because you can make a queen and then, like, win like that, which is pretty gangster. You just allow a queen, but you win the game. Yeah, but none of that even has to happen because Marc Andrea wins the pawn completely and is just two pawns up in an endgame. This is insane. This man is on fire. Queen f3, knight e4, he swarms in, Salem resigns. Marc Andrea is in first place in the challenge. He's winning the challenger section. Remember, the winner of the challengers plays in the Masters next year. So. Dude is cooking. I mean, this, this is a 16-year-old. He's a world under-20 champion, Marc-Andrea. He is, uh, he's crushing. He is absolutely crushing. I got two more games for you. Divya Deshmukh versus Elina Rubers. They are the young women. I believe they're 17, 18 uh, international masters looking for GM norms, looking for big results. Elina yesterday lost to Salem, but has beaten Hans Niemann and Mustafa Yilmaz. Divya has defeated Liam Vrolik and Jaime Santos Latasa. And this game was uh, a French. It was a win hour. It was 92, a gambit line, giving up this pawn on e4. It's a very aggressive line. Black plays knight f6, which I don't believe is the move. 
Uh, I think taking is, I mean, knight f6 is probably fine, but now white builds up this monster fortress with a3, f4. Black tries to create some counterplay. Divya plays knight g3. Divya is just like looking for a scrap. She's looking for checkmate. Plays bishop b5, which is pinning these knights to the king. Black goes here. Now Divya takes this knight to remove the pressure from her center. Castles and plays b4, which controls the dark squares on the queen side. Bishop a6 from Elina. And now h5, rook b1. White looking for b5. Black looking for h4. The bishop slides in. Knight f1 repositioning to the center. And now the queen repositions as well. So white is looking for f5. In this position, black plays king f8, which prevents f5. So now white plays queen h3, looking for g4 and f5. Position is in the balance. Uh, if black plays queen c6, white can play g4. And then apparently be okay. Because obviously the king is here, but it's very dangerous looking. But, but Elena plays knight b8. And now you don't even have to play g4. And Divya plays f5 and basically says, yo, good luck. Good luck defending yourself. By the way, the idea is to sack the knight. Sacrificing the knight works now. You lose a full piece. But the point is, not only do you threaten mate, I'm threatening the rook. I am about to triple up, not right away, because I don't want to lose my rook, but I have like knight d5, I have e6, I can reposition the knight, queen h5, queen h6, bishop e3, bishop h6, a lot of different attacking ideas. Black plays rook g7, and white just keeps going. And Divya Deshmukh absolutely, positively flatlines her opponent. This is an attack, this is an attack. It is a tactical melee, and black just can't keep up. The pawn is poisonous, paralyzing the position. Queen h8 check. Rook takes f6. The bulldozer arrives. Rook f7 and black resigns because if you go to the back rank, it's mate. And if you take, this is mate. Divya Deshmukh absolutely obliterates Elena Rubers. That was a wild game. That was a, a crazy, crazy game of French defense, which was white just built up a perfect setup. And it looked like black has this covered. She didn't. She had it anything but covered. And now, I mean, f5 is just, is just, is just a, a mauling. A very nice attacking game from Divya, who has three and a half points. So she is playing very, very well. And now, the last game of the event. Um, yeah, you got, you, if you made it this far, this was crazy. This was an amazing game between Karabov and uh, Mendonka. It was another French. This one was a Tarash, though. With knight f3, knight d4, don't worry about the theory, you're not going to get quizzed on this. But just like in the French that you just saw, these positions are dynamic, they are interesting, creative, exciting. A lot of different words. And as you can see, the guys are ready for a fight. We're going to see who castles, who doesn't. g h4, bishop h4 looks kind of deranged to allow white to get all of this. Queen b2, take, take. Rook b1 kicking out the queen. Here, for reasons I don't understand, instead of keeping his queen here and losing white's right to castle, he grabs another pawn. So, uh, Leon is up two pawns from the opening. Karabov, however, has a very big lead in development. Black has a much weaker king. But black plays queen a4. And Karabov plays here. The queen rotates around. I mean, you talk about the queen, right? Getting some exercise out here. Queen b6, queen b2, queen a2, queen a4, queen g4, queen g7. Oh my god. Bang, 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 bang. Queen is going on multiple non-stop flights. Karabov goes F F4. Same position as the Divya game. Like, if F5 lands, Leon is dead. His king is just not safe. I mean, just objectively speaking, it's not safe. Like, just so you understand how bad Black's position is if this pawn is on C4, like, it's mate very soon. It is mate very, very, very soon if that happens. So... F4, Leon plays rook g8, just good to have that sniper on the g file. Karabal plays rook f2, and he's just he's just gonna bludgeon this king to death. He's gonna rip it open, gonna hit on that diagonal, he's gonna get the rook to b7. At some point, he's gonna play a 5 and the game is just going to be lost. Bishop 2a6, it's simply a matter of time. There's the move, it's over. Perfect game. Vintage game. It doesn't even matter that black can win two more pawns. Black could be up four pawns in this game and get checkmated. Like, that is how brutal some of this attacking stuff works. Leon plays queen g4. Again, the queen makes a queen move. The queen makes a queen move. Yes, obviously. Pressure here. And now Karabov just has to figure this out. He could take. 
He could take, he could play queen h6. You don't want to go here, actually, believe it or not, because the king is actually surprisingly safe. You want to open the position for your pieces. Fe, Fe, queen h6, just a beautiful game from Karabov. Masterful attacking chess. Rook goes back to g8, and Karabov is completely winning. He is completely winning here if he finds the move knight d4, which is pretty gangster. The idea is very simple. You want to go knight c6, and also you have this in the future of the queens. And if queen d4, queen h7 is winning. So black cannot put the, rook, the king back because you win the rooks. And this is the only thing black can do. So knight d4 just wins the game right now. Like black would have to resign. Because for example, let's say rook c8, bishop f5 disconnects the queen, threatening queen e6. If you take queen d6, king e8, knight f5, gg. G, 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 a lot of Gs. Knight d4 is winning. Instead of that, Korobov takes. So he plays a little too quickly, and now apparently rook f8 is winning, but rook g7 is not, because again, knight d4. Again, there is knight to d4, this idea. And the idea of, uh, of, of knight d4 is really, you know, it's, it's really quite a spectacle. Um... But instead of that, he, he takes like this, which is still good. Now there is rook h8. And all of a sudden, this is a problem. How do you deal with this pin? Frankly, how do you deal with this and mate? Like, you're about to lose all your pieces. But what, white is still winning. White is still winning here because of one of the most absurd stockfish moves I've ever seen in my life. You would think it's check, but then black moves the king and you lose. So what you do here is you take the pawn and attack the knight. What? What about this? You're going to lose your queen or you're going to get mated. Well, in this position, white is still winning with rook d2. Leaving the queen to die because rook d7 is a ladder mate. It's ladder mate on the back rank. What? Now, okay, what if I don't take your queen? What if I sack my knight? I take. The queen is hanging. That is the only way not to lose. This is a massive threat. What if black plays bishop c8? I sacrifice anyway, because now my queen gets in. Oh my god. d c, rook h7, rook d2 is a winning move from Karlov. A quiet move, threatening the knight and threatening the removal of the f6. Yo. Oh my god. Oh, Korobov did not need to let it get this far. He did not need to come up with this absurd Mikhail Tal level sacrifice. He could have just played knight d4, but instead he plays knight h2, and now the position is equal after queen g3. You see, he wanted to remove the defense of the, of the e6 pawn. Now this is a draw. This is a draw because you have this, rook h7, and now you sack your rook to make a oh da, 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 to make a draw this is the draw king c8 king d7 if king c8 actually rook c2 is winning so king e8 queen b8 and it's just the draw which is kind of insane because if you go here you actually lose the game uh even king d5 i think is winning this is so rook b3 is what he plays instead which is trying to deflect the queen but now instead of deflecting the queen and losing the game, Leon just takes the pawn. He takes the pawn. Korobov goes here. Uh, Black is just winning. Black is just up a pawn. But also, he's going to lose a bishop. Queen h4 check, king c8. Knight f3, queen d5. The rook is hanging. Back rank is threatened. Rook h7, rook h1. And my man Anton Korobov just went from playing an absolutely gorgeous attacking game from start to finish. All he needed to do was find this knight d4 idea. He failed to find it. Then he had to find Stockfish reincarnated. He didn't find it. And he goes from, from completely winning to drawn to just straight up losing the game. Oh my god. And Leon wins. Wow. Leon Edwards, Leon Mendonca. Finding last second victories. Snapping them from the jaws of defeat. These are your standings after eight rounds. Marc-Andrea Marizzi leads the challengers with five and a half points after winning three out of his last four games. Giri, Gukesh, and Firuja are tied for first. 
Nepo, Prague, and Nojibek, and Vidit half a point behind. It's crazy. Crazy tournament. Ju and Jun and Dingley Ren have the same amount of points, which is also insane. Both world champions. Crazy stuff. I will see you for round number nine. Tomorrow is a rest day. I will see you on January the 23rd. Get out of here.